Chaitanya Charan Prabhu has been uh, practicing bhakti for many many years now. He is a mentor, monk, speaker. For, uh, he is an author for 25 books on applied mindfulness and purpose for living. His daily articles on Gita Daily keeps coming, and he has given he has given 4,000 inspirational uh, meditations on Bhagavad Gita till now. He has he is an invited guest for TEDx, World Peace Conference, UNESCO, Intel, Google, Microsoft, Salesforce, Stanford, Princeton University, Yale University, Harvard University, MIT, in Cambridge, and whatnot. And Prabhuji gives 400. He has given already 400 talks across 100 cities in four con con continents every year, not just till now, every year. Also, he is a spiritual consultant in Bhaktivedanta Hospital at Mumbai, and he is the member of SAC, that is known as Shastrik Advisory Council, which is the uh, world's uh, most topmost intellectual body in ISKCON that we have. And uh, Prabhuji is uh, a member of that. So actually, he was the first member of uh, an Indian origin, as far as I know. So uh, we are very fortunate to have Prabhuji's association with us. And uh, let us try to understand his uh, deep insights on the subject of science and spirituality. And also, uh, at, after Prabhuji presents his talk, maybe for about um, one hour or so from now, after that, we will open up for questions. So all the students, those who have questions, you can put that, you can cho choose to raise your hands and ask yourself if you can put your video on or otherwise you can put it on the chat box for me to ask on behalf of you. Okay, so Prabhuji, handing it over to you. You can kindly... Hare Krishna. I hope I'm audible to everyone. I'm grateful yes, to be here with all of you today. Mm. I'll begin with some prayers. Om Ajnana Timirandhasya Jnana Anjani Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Itinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pascha Tidesha Tarine Vancha Kalpataru Gesture Kripa Sindhu Gavacha Patitanam Pavani Bio Vaishnavi Bio Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shrivasa the Gauda Bhatta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna So grateful to be here with all of you today and today we'll discuss on the topic of science and scripture how to harmonize them together so i'll take this in three broad parts i'll be sharing a powerpoint where we will be i'll explain certain things and we will have abundant time for question answers later so if you consider this is a broad framework. Now, when we look at scriptural wisdom, some of scriptural knowledge may agree with science, some may disagree with science, and some may transcend science. So now, although I have drawn this in such a way that these three seem to be equivalent, or for some people, the con what contradicts science may seem to be very large. But actually, if we study this, it depends on where we are coming from and how we perceive things. So for some people, this third section of what contradicts this section of what contradict where scripture contradicts science may seem to be very large. But as we grow spiritually and we mature in our understanding, we will recognize that actually that section it will 
and the section that transcends science will become what matters most to us. So let's look at how this will work. So now when we talk about agreeing with science or contradicting science or transcending science, what exactly are we referring to? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So firstly, when we talk about science and we talk about scripture and then we talk about their discourse, their interaction, their dialogue, which may be confrontational at times. Uh, first of all, how do we define science? How do we define scripture? How do we define a contradiction? These themselves are very complex subjects. The science, although it's a, it's a word which is very widely used, science itself doesn't have a very universally agreed definition. Some of the most prominent scientists, like say the pioneering scientists, Newton, Galileo and others, they were not called, they did not call themselves the scientists. The word scientist itself came toward the, uh, came in the late 19th century, in the 1890th centuries. And it was in the late 19th century that it started gaining circulation. So, so Newton called himself as a natural philosopher. That means they observe nature and try to philosophize about what they observe in nature. That's the idea of natural philosophy. So much of what was considered science the time of Newton is today not considered science. Much was not considered science is considered science today. So these definitions themselves are very porous uh, and we need to keep that in mind before uh, arriving at any radical declarations that this contradicts science or this doesn't contradict science. This is that A is scientific and B is unscientific. So first of all, why does it matter for us? It matters because I said, there are some things in scripture which seem to raise serious questions. So I'll approach this first from the perspective of science and then we look at it from the perspective of specific points which may seem to contradict. So let's look at it. So when there is a contradiction, we could consider broadly three possibilities that science could be wrong, science could be incomplete and science and scripture could observe from different scales. So now what do I mean by science is wrong? In much of the history of science is laid with the debris of theories that were considered uh, apps, almost uh, bedrock science later on was shown to be, hey, they're not that true. So for example, more than a, about a, if we went back to about a decade, about a century, century ago, the mainstream idea that was there about the universe, especially in the scientific community was that the universe has a steady state. So this was that the universe is the way it has existed now. That's how it is forever. That is how it has been forever. Now the steady state a theory was propagated and accepted in some ways to avoid confronting the big questions. So generally, whenever we are having a discussion, one of the principles for having a reasonable discussion is not just to say this is right and this is wrong. First to show, okay, this is what I am seeing. Hmm. Okay, and this is what you are seeing. So why, uh, why do the two things agree or disagree? But it's not just enough to say this. It's also important to say, where am I standing when I'm seeing this? And why am I standing there? So imagine a huge mountain peak. So some people might be approaching the mountain peak from one side. Some people may be approaching the mountain peak from another side. The two may say very different things. But the key thing is that although they see, they're seeing the same reality, they're saying it differently. And where the three things, what one is seeing, where one is standing and why one is standing there. If these three things are understood, then there is a possibility for serious discussion where it is not that one person is simply trying to prove the other person wrong. 
So what happens is science itself is, while it talks about uh, the nature of nature, it also is contextual. So certain theories which were considered right at one time, later on they turn out to be, they are rejected by the mainstream community. So we could go into many, many theories like this, but the point here is not to uh, criticize science, it is only to contextualize science. The very idea of progress means that what was known in the past, we need to revise it, we need to improve it, we need to refine it. So then the second is science is incomplete. Now why might science be incomplete? There could be specific theories which could be incomplete, uh, like say the Big Bang Theory. Now the Big Bang Theory of Cosmic Origins, it, it is one theory and it has been developed and revised and reworded in many different ways, reimagined in various ways. But the Big Bang Theory still leaves two important questions unanswered. Whatever existed in the beginning that exploded, where did that come from and what caused it to explode? So to understand why this question is important, let's consider, say, an India-Pakistan cricket match is going on. And then the last ball, India needs a sixer to win the match. And the ball comes and it's a short pitch ball. The batsman hits, maybe it's Virat Kohli who hits the ball for a straight six. And then the whole country celebrates. And then after that post-match, there's an interview. And I'm going to ask, so how did you, how did you hit that sixer? And say, the Indian captain says, you know, it was by the law, by Newton's laws of motion. Really? By Newton's laws of motion? What do you mean by that? So, obviously we could calculate by Newton's laws of motion, okay, the ball came at this speed, it was hit at this speed, and this was the way it made contact with the bat. If, if it had made contact, not in the center, but either in the top or the top edge or the bottom edge, then it wouldn't have gone across the boundary. Hmm. So, we could use the Newton's laws of motion to explain why the ball went across the boundary. Now that is one explanation and that is, a, that is a valid explanation. But is it the most valuable explanation? Is it the most relevant explanation at that point? Well, not really. Newton's laws of motion can't explain the skill of the batsman. The, it can't explain the precise hand to feet coordination, the sharp vision, the presence of mind, all that goes on into making a great batsman. So the point I'm making here is that just as for the ball going across the boundary, it could be explained in terms of Newton's laws of motion. But and that just because of explanation is valid doesn't make it valuable. Just because something is correct doesn't make it complete. So science offers explanations and they are correct, but they may not be complete because certain parameters are left out of the explanation. So the third process, so we'll, we'll discuss each of these points more in detail as we move forward. The third possibility could be that things are different because they are being observed from different scales of observation. That there are different levels to reality and the same thing can be observed from different levels. So let's look at these one by one. So now when we talk about reality, what exactly do we mean by reality and how does it work? So, what happens is whenever there is data, science is concerned with observation. The observation is you can have three straight points. Now, based on those three points, you could draw a straight line. You could we could draw a hyperbola. We could draw a circle. We could do a parabola. We could draw so many. Uh, we could draw an arc. So, which set of uh, which gra which kind of graph we draw based on the data that can vary. Uh, very, very much. So similarly, what science gives us essentially is observations. And based on those observations, certain 
certain conceptions are arrived at or sometimes the conceptions come first and the observations confirm or disprove those conceptions but the point is even if the observations are valid they can they could be interpreted in different ways and that's why the idea that scientific knowledge could be incorrect or incomplete this is not a criticism of science this is just a historically contextualized cognition of how science works now when we say science is there something beyond science when i say science is incomplete just like the batsman's expertise we could measure the speed with which a bowler bowls a ball we could measure how far the sixer goes uh, outside the stadium but can we quantify the skill of the batsman we have various systems of rating players who is the top player for this year who top batsman top bowler but that is about their performance can we rate talent itself can we rate caliber itself not necessarily it's very difficult it's a difficult world of science and reality so we can say what science studies is like this small yellow part below and there is a much bigger reality that science doesn't study now again when i say science doesn't study something the point here is again not to criticize it is to contextualize we see reality around us is extremely complicated if i just take this small glass now i could do a phd thesis on a glass itself so what is the ideal size of the glass what is the ideal weight what is the ideal material and when you talk about ideal for whom is it ideal maybe for a baby for a small child below 10 something else is ideal for a athletic youth something else is ideal for a adult something else is ideal for a aged person something else might be ideal so something as simple as a glass can become almost unlimitedly complicated when we start studying it deeply so what happens whenever we study a subject we tend to focus we tend to focus on certain parameters so is this a good glass well it depends on what my purpose is if my purpose is to maybe increase my fluid intake because i drink less water then maybe having a larger glass helps if so science when it began its study right from the time of galileo and others science divided nature into two parameters or two we could say two properties what it called as primary properties and what it called as secondary properties so primary properties according to science are those that are measurable those that are quantifiable and then science had phenomenal success in relating these parameters through mathematical equations and that's how all our technology has developed at the same time when focus goes on one thing focus goes off other things so the secondary parameters about such as say what are secondary parameters when we eat food at one level we are concerned okay how much calories is this particular thing that i am taking if you are diet conscious we might be conscious of that but that's not the primary thing we are concerned about when we want to eat food we want to know how tasty it is we want to know how overall healthy it is so now if you want to know how tasty it is we can't have a tastometer to tell how tasty it is taste is a very real experience for us the taste itself is not mathematically measurable the the composition the ingredients can be scientifically analyzed can be scientifically measured but taste is something higher this is a whole there is a whole subject in the philosophy of science called qualia qualia is the properties that we experience in nature uh, what are they so when we if we consider medical science one of its primary purposes is to free people from disease and pain and despite all our best advances in science and the, and the advances are often impressive oh, through medical science now we can know what is going on even in the smallest cell in the in the most uh, unreachable part of the human body and yet through it all 
we can't through all those instruments we can't actually measure pain no we can't quantify how much pain are you in well you can't really say that while pain is a very real experience it's not a mathematically quantifiable experience so why are we talking about this the, the point here is to contextualize science that science focuses on talking about the measurable properties with the nature and their mutual interactions and while it has been phenomenally successful in that there are things which are left out within this scientific world view and some of the things that are left out in such a world view are what we talked about just now are, are also important in our lived experience so unless we recognize that there is something higher that we all live for that there are other things that matter for us without that understanding we will our own understanding of reality will be fragmented so now what i am saying is not just something which i am saying because i am a spiritualist you know i i was trained in science and engineering and this is this is a point which also thoughtful uh, scientists have recognized so this is nobel laureate schrodinger erwin schrodinger saying this so i am amazed i am very astonished that the scientific picture of the real world around me is very deficient it gives a lot of factual inf information puts all our experience in a magnificently consistent order but it is ghastly silent about all and sundry that is really near to our heart that really matters to us it cannot tell us a word about red and blue bitter and sweet physical pain and physical delight it knows nothing of of beautiful and ugly good or bad god and eternity science sometimes pretends to answer questions in those domains but the answers are very often so silly that we are not inclined to take them seriously so this is a scientist not just an ordinary scientist this is a a very prominent scientist speaking this and why is he speaking this not to criticize science but to contextualize science science is a very powerful tool for acquiring knowledge and every tool has its purpose so he is recognizing what is the purpose of this tool it gives us two things factual information and it puts all our experiences in magnificently consistent order magnificently consistent order means that it enables us to <clears throat> to say if i am if we are flying from say mumbai to new york then which flight will reach there in how much time where it will be at a particular time how based on the speed of the airplane based on the speed of the winds all this can be predicted with a significant amount of accuracy and that's very helpful in planning things and executing things so in that sense it puts in a very consistent order the factual information is put in consistent order so science so we, you remember i talked about the first circle that there is something which agrees with science something which contradicts science and something which transcends science so if we consider our lived reality we all use science definitely no doubt at the same time we all live with things much more than what science talks about what do i mean by that <clears throat> a couple of years in america a seminar in a university a multi part seminar on overcoming fear so there and we discussing how people's fears change over various over time so what were the 10 top 10 fears in the 18th century 19th century 20th century 21st century now as far as sociological data goes we can find that out so in the 21st century two new fears have come in among the top 10 one is the fear of terrorists and the second is the fear of rejection rejection means that when people want to form some relationships whether it is india or the rest of the world in the past most relationships most marriages were formed with some kind of arrangement 
there is a of commitment and irreversibility to the to the idea of marriage but today it is not there so whenever people form a relationship there is a great fear that i may be rejected either i may be rejected and the relationship itself may not form or the relationship may start but just before it can uh, arrive at the level of commitment it may be rejected i may be rejected or sometimes it may be that uh, after decades of being together i may be rejected so it's a great fear and whenever so whenever people want to form a relationship they would like to know does this other person really care for me or do they care only for my looks or for my for my bank account now with all our scientific advancement you know, we cannot develop a love meter no say if a boy proposes to a girl i love you please marry me and the girl says okay let me take out a love meter place it on your heart and see do you really care for me well we can't do that although love is a real experience and we really long to experience it it is again not mathematically quantifiable so even if say somebody lets us down somebody disappoints us somebody betrays us okay how do you quantify betrayal we can't so the point is that although science and its its product technology have radically reformulated reshaped the world we live in still there is much in our life that cannot be reduced to science and that is not the deficiency of, that is not a that is again not to criticize science that is again to remind that you know it is not that life is to be reduced to science rather science is to be placed within our life science exists because we exist we as thinking humans we have we have developed science so in a sense uh, this is just if we contextualize things there will be science, things which are which transcend science and that that sector of your transcend science that is where we fo focus in spirituality so in spirit so science we could say is the study of matter spirituality is the study of what matters what matters what is really important in life what what is what will make my life meaningful what will bring fulfillment in my life now what is it that i need to choose and what is i need to what what do i need to not do there is very important decisions in our life and we cannot do them simply based on science alone science can be one valuable source of guidance but at the same time we all what really matters for us so science cannot tell what really matters for us and what really matters the analysis of that the study of that is spirituality so which among very our various relationships which relationships are most important for us among our various values what values are the most important for us among our various goals or purposes in life which are the most important for us can they be placed in a hierarchy how do we place them in a hierarchy all this is the domain of spirituality so if we study scripture whether we study the bhagavad gita or we study the shrimad bhagavatam or these are all focusing on what matters arjuna when he is has to face a fratricidal war at that time he starts thinking what is what matters really for me is it winning the kingdom or is it protecting my dynasty then he realizes it's not that simple that actually it's not just my dynasty is there on the other side my dynasty is my family is also there on this side and it's not simply winning the kingdom it's also ensuring that those who are wishes don't gain power so what really matters so the bhagavad gita or the mahabharat if we consider at large the mahabharat talks about advanced technology in the time, in the sense of some very sophisticated weapons which are used at that time but they are analyzing and discussing them is not the thrust of the mahabharat that is definitely not the thrust of the bhagavad gita the thrust of the bhagavad gita is okay pruchami tvam dharma sammudha chetah 
what is dharma what what am i meant to do what is the right thing for me to do dharma essentially can I, dharma can have many meanings have, have many meanings but it is in the context of arjuna what is the right thing to do for me so that is what the bhagavad gita discusses so spirituality is the study of what matters in the shrimad bhagavatam parikshit maharaj is cursed to die in 7 days at that time the questions come up okay what should a person do when they are about to die so as even today that question remains if somebody gets a terminal diagnosis of cancer then often there are there are issues of quality of life and nowadays in end of life care in hospice care spiritual health is considered almost of supreme importance because once a person is diagnosed that they are going to die and mainstream science doesn't have much to offer to help them except in palliative care to help them deal with to manage the pain then what does the person want to do maybe they have 3 months to live 6 months to live what do they want to do that is where a chaplain comes in or some end of care cons- end of end of life care consultant comes in and people do want to do something that is spiritually meaningful for them and that is the discussion of the bhagavad gita of the bhagavad bhagavatam so the study of matter versus the study of what matters so when we study scripture when we study books like the bhagavad gita or the shrimad bhagavatam the third sector that which transcends science that is what the is the primary thrust and with that thrust in mind whatever is not that we need we focus on that when we are studying scripture and to go toward that sector that section those sections which agree with science we can use them as initial take off points they may trigger our interest they may help us gain some credibility they may help us nurture our faith but ultimately it is the section that transcends scripture that guides us how we can live that's what matters and then the the quadrant where science and scripture contradict each other how do we deal with that yes there are different ways to deal with that and i will take one example uh, to deal with that right now and then we will move on to question answers uh, so till now i talked about interacting the interaction of science and spirituality and i focused on how there is a domain beyond science and that matters for us and that is what spirituality and the spiritual texts primarily discuss so let's look at something over here so one of the more disturbing aspects of of scripture is its cosmology so the bhagavat puran for example describes a cosmology that seems can to be quite strange and some people might say unbelievable and shila prabhupad has also made certain statements about the moon which can seem very provocative so we could say did man go to the moon or not Now this is isn't this a place where science and scripture contradict? Not exactly. Why is that? Because if we consider what Shri Prabhupada was primarily saying, his point was that the moon is. a different level of moon exists at a different level of reality and those without the proper qualification cannot enter there just like now if somebody wants to go to america they need to get they need to get uh, go through the proper immigration channels they need to get the visa and they can enter into america after that now some people a large number of people can break through the immigration system and especially through south america, from southern america from mexico and others a lot of immigrants go in there that's true uh, but that's because it's a, it's a more human system which is fall- fallible but those systems which are governed by higher beings they're not that fallible so the point was not that we can't go to the moon the point was 
that there is a different vision of the moon. The moon is not just seen as one, one ob another object of the many objects that are existing in space, which are just filled with uh, empty space. The moon is seen as a higher planet. So why would somebody see like that? What is the point over there? So here we talk about perspectives. So scale of observation. If you consider say, this is chalk powder and this is coke powder. Let me take. Now, if you mix both of them together, we'll get gray powder. Now, if you look at this gray powder under a microscope, what will you see? You won't see any gray powder. You will see actually white particles and black particles. So what is it actually? Is it white particles and black particles? Or is it a gray powder? Well, it depends on the scale of observation. It depends on what scale we are observing it. <clears throat> so, even if sometimes there are some, sometimes there are some videos on YouTube which talk show about how even the most captivating face, most beautiful face, if it is seen under a microscope, it, it appears to be filled with valleys and mountains and peaks and all kinds of undulating surfaces. What looks very smooth and shiny uh, to our normal eyes doesn't look that way under a microscope. So the scale of observation changes perception substantially. So the point of the Bhagavatam, if we consider, what is the point of the Bhagavatam? The Bhagavatam is not being spoken to give Parikshit Maharaj a PhD in cosmology. That is not the interest of Parikshit Maharaj also. Parikshit Maharaj's interest is, okay, I'm going to die soon and I want to fix my mind on transcendence. I want to fix my mind on Krishna. And for that purpose, what do we do? What, what is done? Shukdev Goswami gives him a vision of things where uh, how everything, how there is latent spirituality everywhere, that is what is being shown. So I, I was in America and I met, um, actually in Canada, and I met a devotee over there whose friend is a property developer. And this friend from America, he's basically a golf course developer. He makes golf. So he came from Canada to Vrindavan to, because there was a, the, apparently the government over there wanted to develop golf courses. And he came to Vrindavan to uh, pro pro present a tender to look at the property and to give his proposal and everything like that. So he came to Vrindavan. He went to Govardhan because the, uh, Govardhan is the sacred mountain associated with Krishna Leela. And he went there, but he didn't visit a single temple over there. His interest, although he came to the most sacred of places in the world, his interest was totally commercial, it was not spiritual. And all that he saw there, okay, this land is good, this land is not so good, here we need to flatten the mountain over here, here we have to do this, we have to do that. So what happens is our intention determines our vision. Now this is, so there were many things, there are many, many other things, many spiritual things in Vrindavan to see, but he didn't see them. He didn't seek them, he didn't see them. Now, if you go back to my earlier point of when science focuses on primary properties, not secondary properties, or what, what science considers secondary properties. So take that further and we look at the Bhagavatam and we look at the at science. So. Uh, science, even when scientists, uh, space scientists want to study the moon, they are approaching it from the perspective of maybe another place to stay, another place to uh, mine some minerals, another place to say plant the flag of the earth. So it is, it is primarily seen with a particular perspective. So whereas spirituality talks of things from a different perspective. So now what is the reality? Both realities could coexist because they are at different scales of perception. So, so at a physical level, 
it may be possible that somebody might go to the moon, go to the moon and come back it may not be we don't know but the point is when prabhupada talks about the moon mission his focus is that if we want to experience the moon at a higher level we need to expand our consciousness to that higher level we need to without expanding that consciousness to a higher level without gaining the appropriate qualifications in terms of karma that lead to the expansion of consciousness even if we are able to physically go to the moon we won't perceive the moon so one example to illustrate this point of how qualification or adhikar as the word is used in sanskrit matters suppose somebody is working on a mainframe computer it has incredible processing power phenomenal amounts of memory and different people are at different terminals on that mainframe computer and you no know, different operator different people working on that computer will have different levels of access for somebody who is a data entry operator they may have access only to one small drive or one set of files within that somebody who is a manager they may have a slightly higher access somebody who is a ceo they may have full access why the difference it's the same computer and they all may say that we are working on the same computer but somebody who is say a data entry operator not only will they not be able to access certain files since certain files you know this you can see the folder you can see the file but say you don't have the permission to access it but some in some cases it may be that those files are hidden from their view itself so when they are hidden from the view itself what it means is that they can't be seen at all their existence itself is not perceived so why is that that's because they don't have that qualification so similarly when the bhagavatam describes certain cosmology it is you know, parikshit maharaj is asking shukdev goswami now parikshit maharaj is not asking shukdev goswami to simply elaborate what he can see with his eyes he wants to see a higher vision ultimately he wants to see krishna he wants to remember krishna and if you see the bhagavatam's cosmology in the fifth canto uh, it's not so much about all about cosmographical specifics it's more about how throughout the universe there is dharma and devotion and therefore parikshit Mah parikshit maharaj you also should practice dharma and devotion so the whole idea is the study of what matters and he, so so the bhagavatam's cosmology and modern cosmology are they contradictory no they are from different scales of perception somebody may you know, say oh, this is all just made up this is just something which you thought up to actually conceal the point that this is all unscientific but just to maintain your faith in all these things you are saying that there is a higher level of perception and you need to expand your consciousness but it because it contradicts science it all is false well could be but maybe it's not that simple why not because you know, even within vedic cosmology itself uh, there have been different cosmological sources of knowledge so within vedic cosmology there is what is called as puranic cosmology and there is jyotishya cosmology so jyotishya cosmology purana puranic cosmology gives us perspective from a celestial or a, trans, or a divine perspective it is a higher vision of the universe vision of the universe from a higher perspective the jyotishya cosmology gives us perspective from our level and you know there are books like the surya siddhanta which give remarkably precise information about the cosmos far before modern science discovered it so for example if we consider the distance the cosmic distances say what modern science measurement talks about as the distance between the <clears throat> earth and the moon we will see that to here 252710 miles versus 253000 250000 miles it's remarkably similar similarly earth's diameter 
is 7840 miles compared with 7926 miles, which is again remarkably similar. So this now, many of the same scholars, if you know, if we study Indian astronomy, there is Aryabhatta, there is Bhaskaracharya, there are many other prominent astronomers. So they study the Jyotishi Shastras and they also knew our Puranic cosmology. But although they were aware of the differences between the two and even in our own tradition, there were the great saintly commentators who are who use Jyotishya for astrological purposes and they also studied Bhagavatam cosmology. They were aware that the two differ. But you now one of the characteristics of an expanded consciousness is Comfort with contradiction. If you forget everything from this talk, because it's too technical, if you just remember this one point, that one of the characteristics of an expand, uh, one of the key characteristics of an expanded consciousness is comfort with contradiction. Now you say, what do you mean? How can I be comfortable with contradiction? Well, yes, we can be comfortable with contradiction because we understand. Uh, we understand that humility is not just a religious or a physical idea. It also has to be an intellectual idea. In, that means, so humility in the religious domain means I believe that there is a God who is far more powerful than me. Humility in the physical domain means I may offer my uh, prostrated obeisances. But humility in the intellectual domain means that reality is far more complicated, far more complex than what I know. So not only what I know, maybe what is more complex than what I can know. So yes, there can be different perspectives and people who are wiser than me have seen those two perspectives and they've accepted. In modern physics, I'll conclude with this particular example for this point now, that in this comfort with contradiction is something which characterizes even you go into any branch of knowledge if you go deep inside it to function you have to become comfortable with contradiction consider physics itself if you go deep into physics there are two prominent theories in physics there's quantum physics and there is relativity and the two are significantly different some people may say even they're, they're violently contradictory their vision of matter itself is very different is it that in quantum physics holds that I'll, that everything actually only when there is observer then things fall into place now einstein is undoubtedly one of the greatest brains of the last century if not the greatest scientific brains he couldn't digest the whole idea of quantum physics and he said that i would like to believe that the moon continues to exist even if I'm not looking at it. You say, isn't that obvious? Obviously the moon continues to exist. But actually quantum physics is not, actually everything is simply waves. And when there's observer, then things, things coagulate, collapse, uh, or things are pursued as things. Now, I'm, this is a extremely simplified bare bones uh, analysis of an extremely complicated uh, problem. But the point I'm making here is, that, that even within science, there are different perspectives and the theories which come from different perspectives. And which works? Well, both work. For certain domains of reality, quantum physics works. For certain domains of reality, uh, uh, relativity works. And how to bring the two of them together, science is struggled and has not made much headway in doing that. A scientist as great as Stephen Hawking said that man's quest, he, he put the inability to reconcile the two positively and he said, I'm happy to announce that humanity's quest for knowledge will never end. So we'll never be able to reconcile these two. Stephen Wienberg, another no, uh, no, a Nobel laureate scientist said that you know, we have made remarkable progress over the last several decades. But the more we come to know, the further we seem to go from the solution. So currently, how does science operate? It operates on pragmatism. Pragmatism means what works. 
So for certain domains of reality where quantum physics work, although quantum physics doesn't make any sense in terms of the way we empirically perceive the world, but it works incredibly well and quantum physics is used extensively. Now we are moving toward quantum computing, which could be a significant leap in computing power and speed. So there are certain areas where relativity works and where it works, that's what is used. So humility means to not claim that we need to get an exhaustive reconciliatory understanding of every aspect of reality before we move forward. Now we, we, are, we, are, we are finite beings and we want all the wisdom that we can get to make our life as meaningful and as joyful as possible. To do as much good as we can during our short lifetimes for, for ourselves and for the world around us. So if that is the purpose, then science and spirituality can both be invaluable resources for us. So to, if you want to reconcile the two, not philosophically, because that is extremely difficult, but pragmatically, in terms of how we function in our lives, we could say that science, primarily through technology, science can make things better. Science can give us faster phones, can give us uh, faster planes. Science can make things better. And spirituality can make people better. Spirituality can help us uh, understand what really matters in our lives and to focus on that and to grow thereby. Spirituality can help us increase our virtues to improve our good habits, to, per, to free ourselves from whatever vices we have. Spirituality can empower us internally, science can empower us externally. And together, if we, we use both science and spirituality, then by making things better externally, by making ourselves better internally, we can contribute to making a better world. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. I spoke on reconciling science and scripture. And I spoke primarily with three main points. First is, we talked about the domain, three, di three quadrants, scriptural knowledge, something which agrees, something which disagrees, and something which contradicts. So why might there be a contradiction? And why might there be a disagreement? That was our primary focus. So am I there, could there, is there something that transcends? So I talked about how science is a progressive body of knowledge. And that's why things which are right now may be considered uh, wrong in the future. Things which were considered right in the past are considered wrong now. So then we discussed about the domains of knowledge. That science is the study of matter, spirituality is the study of what matters. Study of matter means science focuses on certain primary properties. I showed the code of Arvind Schrodinger that it focuses on measurable parameters of the observed universe and the mathematical correlations between them. But in that process, much that is vital for us is left aside. I talked about panometer, lavometer, or even tastometer. These taste, love, pain, these are very important experiences for us. Some of them we want, some of them we don't want. We don't want pain, we want love, we want taste. But these we can't quantify. So, th so there is much that exists beyond the domain of science. So the laws of gravity can explain why a stroke went across the boundary, but it can't explain it completely. It's a correct, but not a complete explanation. So the, that section which transcends science is the primary thrust of the spiritual, spiritual text like the Bhagavad Gita or the Srimad Bhagavatam. And then when, when there is a contradiction, <clears throat> how do we look at it? So I talk about contradiction can happen because there are different scales of perception. So one contradiction is because certain things are beyond the domain of science. Uh, there seems to be a contradiction, but it's not exactly a contradiction. It's just they are two different domains of reality being pursued. But even when there is, seems to be a contradiction, it could be because there are different scales of perception. So uh, 
powder can seem gray to the uh, a naked eye but it can be seen as white and brown particles under microscope similar the universe to the scientific eye the moon and the various objects can seem to be just empty space that is waiting for waiting to be conquered by human beings but to a more expanded consciousness it's seen differently it's seen as permeated with life which we can't see just like if we have a mainframe computer we may not be able to see what's there in that computer if we don't have the required access so that access depends on the level of our consciousness and is this idea of higher consciousness and higher access just a way to to explain away the what is actually unscientific and invalid no because that same tradition also gave empirical knowledge that is comparable with science what scientific knowledge science modern science has acquired but it gave it before so there were teachers in the past uh, great scholars who knew about these two different things the jyotisha shastra and the puranic cosmology jyotisha cosmology and they were they were comfortable with contradiction so humility in the intellectual domain means that maybe we don't know and maybe we can't know so rather than focusing on trying to know exhaustively we focus on what works effectively and that's what physics approach physics adopts so quantum physics and uh, relativity are not so easily reconcilable but even scientists are pragmatic so we too can be pragmatic and we use science as a resource for improving things in the outer world and we use spirituality as a resource for improving things in the inner world and by combining both we all can contribute to making a better world thank you very much hare krishna so are there any questions or comments yes prabhu so i will ask questions prabhu ji i yes sure so the first question is uh from a students from hbtu kanpur how where and why did this seed of atheism build up so much just in recent age uh, almost 200 years ago uh, by the scientific community mm -hmm. okay what are the last part about scientific community can you repeat the last sentence i'll repeat the question how where and why did this seed of atheism build up so much just in the recent age almost 200 years by the scientific community okay so how, how did atheism grow and did it grow because of scientific community well it's very difficult to know what is a causal relationship there is causation and there is correlation so what is the difference between the two it has been found that people with bigger hands have bigger vocabularies hey that is strange we are whenever i speak this in the class everybody start looking at their hands well you may say what does people's hand size got to do with vocabulary well what happens is people with bigger hands are older people with smaller hands are say kids so an average kids vocabulary and average adults vocabulary is going to be def definitely different so there is yes yes it's true that bigger hands and uh, bigger vocabulary are go together but it's not a causal relationship it's a simply a correlation and there is something else which is causing both so uh similarly yes science has advanced in the last two centuries and also religion and faith in god has gone down so now is this to is the causal relationship has scientific advancement led to atheism so that or is it a correlation that's what we need to carefully understand so is science is itself a tool for acquiring knowledge like arvind schrodinger said that science cannot talk about god it it doesn't tell us anything about god now when 
uh, scientists like Galileo or Newton, they talked about God. That was their personal, we could say, conclusion based on their scientific observation. In science, there is a certain there is a certain process, certain criteria for proving certain things. And by definition, that which is spiritual is beyond beyond empirical validation. It is Adhokshaja is one of the names of the Supreme Lord. So the study of scientific knowledge or the study of the universe through science can lead many people to believe in God. It can also lead many people to disbelieve in God. Now why? So science itself may or may not be the cause. Science is simply a tool for looking at the world in a particular way. Over the last few centuries, what has happened is that society has changed in extraordinary ways. There's been industrialization, there has been urbanization, there has been uh, fragmentation of uh, social structures like joint families. And therefore, uh, religious traditions and spiritual wisdom was passed down through certain channels. And those channels got disrupted. In the West now, it's almost half of the children who grow up, they grow up in between one fourth to one half of children grow up in single parent families. So if there's only one parent, usually it's a mother, sometimes it's a single father, then, you know, just taking care of the child becomes a big thing. Teaching them religious values, it's very, very difficult. So along with that, what also happened? So, so basically, uh, one reason why atheism increased was the structures that uh, that that the systems and the structures that passed down spirituality and theism they were disrupted. Another reason was that um, religious extremism or the consequences of extremism of any kind became very prominent. Sometimes the idea is that religion causes violence and it, it is true that religion has caused violence. At the same time, if you consider the First World War, Second World War, they were not fought on religious grounds, they were fought, fought on ide the ideological grounds or simply property and uh, power. Uh, so, but what happened is that um, over the last few centuries, religious extremism has not only increased, but it has also gained increased visibility and influence because of technology. Because of technology, religious extremism has gained increased reach. Now, terrorists in some part of the Middle East can blow up things in, in America or wherever they want. And through social media, we get to know about all that. So very easily and even before social media through television. So what has happened? Because of this in the public mind, religion is associated with extremism. Now religion inspires many, many people to live more charitably, more compassionately, more responsibly. <coughs> if, say people, if people are religiously inclined, they stay committed to their, for example, their marriage vows, and there, there is quite strong, strong uh, connection between the two statistically has been found out. But so overall, religion inspires people to do good things. Religion, in the name of religion, people also do bad things. But the bad things get a lot more press. Uh, and that's why, because in the public eye, religion has been associated with extremism. So that has also led to the increase in atheism. Now has science itself played a role in that. So I talked about the sociological changes. I talked about the changes in the religious landscape also. <clears throat> Another aspect is also that science itself, has it led to atheism? Well, <clears throat> science has been misused by atheists 
to foist their atheistic ideology on people in today's world most people think that if i want to be scientific i can't believe in concepts like god or soul well why not there is nothing in science there is no scientific theory that can explicitly disprove the existence of god or the existence of soul so they are not within the domain of scientific study now the domain of scientific study can be expanded and maybe they will be included but but they're not within the domain of scientific study as science is defined by mainstream in in the mainstream academy today so there are a significant number of scientists even nobel laureates and not just old time nobel laureates even contemporary nobel laureates who do believe in science however again in the public perception the idea has come that science is associated with atheism or other not other not science is so science is associated with atheism that to be scientific i need to be atheistic if i am if i'm believing in stuff like god maybe i'm not being scientific so that is the misconception that we need to counter there are many scientists who believe in god and sometimes they talk about their belief but there are many atheists who talk about god uh, so but in the negative terms that god doesn't exist and unfortunately in today's world this is the last factor i will uh, conclude with for answering this question that secularism was originally defined as impartiality toward religion but secularism has now become not impartiality toward religion but indifference toward religion or uh, that means in today's world if there is a christian scientist or a muslim scientist or a hindu scientist if they are talking in their classrooms but they cannot talk about their their, their religious beliefs because you know, we have to be secular but on the other hand an atheistic scientist can talk about atheism and because apparently atheism is not considered to be a religion but atheists can be as dogmatic and as intolerant towards religion as some of the most fundamentalist religions can be towards other atheists can be towards other religions or towards atheists so because of secularism in public eye scientists often don't talk about their faith whereas atheists talk about their faith and if it's there are there are religious scientists and there are irreligious scientists so irreligious scientists or non religious scientists talk about their non religion non belief whereas religious scientists don't talk about their belief so that's how we see that atheism has increased if science is studied systematically then there is no reason why science should lead to atheism i hope that answers the question yes prabhu very nice yeah. so another question is from uh, students of iit hyderabad uh, we know that entropy mm -hmm. is associated with every matter can it be associated with mm -hmm. the expansion of universe too is there any spiritual angle associated with the entropy and universe expansion okay mm -hmm. i presume mm. is there any association between the expansion of the universe and entropy well <clears throat> we could look at this from a for perspective and we could look at also from a uh, perspective of say, spirituality so the idea of entropy can be used to in general talk about the point that there is no way a self organizing universe could sustain itself forever in general the idea is that things degenerate over time so if there is a certain amount of order in a universe in the in any particular system that order will go down now for that order to be maintained or for that order to be improved 
how does that happen so the idea of entropy is sometimes associated with the idea of some kind of cosmic design because things they degenerate over time and if they're degenerating then they if naturally things move toward degeneration then for them to have been in a state where they were not degenerated where they had a high level of integrity and energy and functionality how did that come about so it is sometimes used as an argument to point toward some higher intelligence or higher uh, aspects within the observed physical universe now the expansion of the universe is something which uh, is accepted by mainstream science today and the idea is we have seen distant objects moving further away from us and we have seen certain other things like that so there is also the cosmic background ego echo so the expansion of the universe itself is not something which is uh, which has intrinsically any spiritual ex ex implications that uh, within the spiritual or the scriptural conception of the universe there is there is expansion there is contraction there is expansion there is contraction so i would say that whether entropy whether entropy points to a higher intelligence or whether entropy is associated with the expansion of the universe or not these are issues that scientists can debate theorize and come to their conclusions they don't have any direct spiritual implications either way they can be used to point to the so the idea of entropy can be used to point to what a higher existence and whether the universe is expanding or not that could be both the expansion of the universe and its non expansion or even its contradiction can be accommodated within the scriptural world view does that answer your question yes bro bro the next question is from the students of iisc bangalore uh, the question is that the how does the soul come in the mother's womb uh, in the uh, scriptures it is written that the father semen and it comes through grains is there any scientific understanding for the same which matches the scriptures okay so how does the soul come into the say the mother's womb in the embryo in general when scriptures describe any material phenomena usually that description is indicative it is not always exhaustive what do i mean by indicative versus exhaustive indicative means this is one way it can happen it is not that this is the only way it happens so when it is said in the upanishads that it is through the in the bhagavatam also it is said mm, that through the man semen the soul comes into the into the mother's womb yes that is that is uh, one possible trajectory is that the only trajectory well there is no no reason for the soul to be limited that way there is uh, just like i earlier talked about the the skill of say the, of virat kohli in hitting a sixer and the laws of physics laws of motion both can be complementary explanations for why the ball went across the boundary so similarly the physical and the spiritual ex explanations for the origin of not the origin of life you could say origin for the conception and procreation can exist together so there is at a biological level certain things happen biological level the sperm enters into the enters into through the uh, uh, through the uterus into the mother's womb and then uh, to be mother's womb and then there is a union there is a zygote that is formed so now if we look at it from a biological perspective we see that even uh the semen that is there it contains many sperms 
so if you look at from biological perspective further you know which which of those sperms actually reach the destination it's a perilous journey and many of them don't make it to the destination even after they make it to the destination after that whether how many survive and how much moves forward so even among when there are twins so most so twins can be either identical or non identical monozygotic or bizygotic or polyzygotic so what happens is that that means one zygote is formed and then it splits into two or sometimes two zygotes are formed that means say one sperm uh unites with an egg and then it splits into two and there are two twins or there are two sperm that unite with two zygotes and then they grow so now what does this mean even if we consider there's one sperm does one sperm have to contain only one soul there could be some sperms that don't contain any souls at all there could be some sperms that contain more than one soul and then they unite and those two souls occupy those two bodies so those two bodies in the case of monozygotic twins and <clears throat> uh we also so there are lots of factors and lots of subtleties involved so if we consider that uh, it is also said that the when a man and a woman unite the consciousness determines the kind of child that will be born now if that is the case then what does it mean that there are so many sperms entering into the womb so then is it that only the sperm that has the consciousness which matches both the consciousness of the mother and father that sperm impregnates and other consciousness do, other other sperms do not impregnate uh, they, they do not form a zygote there could be many sperms that enter like that only one sp this particular sperm survives and others don't survive so these are all uh, these are all complicated questions and in general when we talk about the interface between the spiritual and the material it's more important to focus on the principles than on the mechanisms why because the spiritual domain itself is subtle and so how the subtle interacts with the gross that itself again becomes subtle it, it, there is there is certain gross effects that we can see but the mechanism by which those growth effects come about that is that is sometimes very complicated so here what are we looking at just like now to give us give a another example of this subtle and gross interaction gross the complexity of their interactions so currently if the world is facing a pandemic uh, viruses actually they they are a good example of the complexity is a virus living or non living no well, it's it's like a, there is a wherever there is life there is soul but viruses on themselves don't exhibit any life but when they have a host they start exhibiting life that means the soul needs a biological medium for functioning and the soul doesn't have a biological medium suitable biological medium it can't function at the physical level once the soul acquires a biological medium it starts functioning so so now currently when scientists study okay is this pandemic is if somebody has been infected are they likely to get infected once again by corona even if they are not likely to get infected can a person who has been infected and who has recovered will that person be a passive carrier or has the corona count gone down so much that that person will neither try will then not be infected again or will not pass it on to others But these are all questions which we are still grappling we don't have answers so when the subtle impacts the gross not only subtle and difficult to understand the subtle impact the gross is also difficult to understand the broad principle is that the so but if we consider the complexity of the interactions that means that it's it's not just that those pathways alone are there that there are there are various other kinds of uh, there are various nuances going on over there and uh, we can't really control uh, we ca we can't, can't control that interaction sufficiently to know it specifically that this is the only way or these are the only ways things happen the subtle can interact with the gross in many different ways 
just as the soul can leave the body in many different ways at death normally it is said if a person is in elevated consciousness then the soul will leave through one of the upper holes that means through the eyes through the ears through the nose uh, the nostrils if the soul is not in elevated consciousness the soul will depart from the one of the lower holes the two excretory organs and it will go towards a lower region now this is a broad trajectory but is this absolute the soul can even break through the skull and go out if it is required so there are certain indicative trajectories that are given but these are not exhaustive does it answer your question yes prabhu ji next question is from um, shubham prabhu prabhu ji you talked about there are two types of fear which has added in the 21st century fear of terrorism and fear of rejection but if we see things in the history there were much bigger fights and killing that happened before so how do we understand that those fights were different from terrorism that you are connecting to now okay that's because generally in the past even when their fights civilians were not targeted this was definitely not in india when megasthenes and others came after after uh, alexander they found one aspect of warfare in india was civilians farmers would go on doing their farming while soldiers were passing by and wars would take place so in general civilians would not be targeted and even if civilians were targeted it was uh, occasional for for maybe looting them at least that was the broad as a code of honor in the past even among warriors so now if you consider at least if you consider mahabharat the code of honor was that you should fight with equals who are equipped and alert equals who are equipped and alert but terrorists do exactly the opposite when they attack their their combatants who attack civilians who have no weapons and who are just going about their normal life so the amount of fear caused by terrorism is far greater than the amount of fear caused by wars because of the heavy level of unpredictability and brutality that is associated with it okay. any other questions yes prabhu uh, prabhu ji uh, this question has come from ggd students from giri govardhan voice uh, are aliens real or fiction is there any scientific okay. proof okay so are aliens real or fictional i would say i'd answer this in three broad parts first is the existence of aliens second is the possibility of perceiving aliens and third is the mm, the validity of the current claims of perception three distinct things now firstly the word aliens itself is a modern term and often people have the idea of some green beings with some eyes popping up or something like that but if we consider that broadly speaking is there life outside the earth beyond the earth the vedic scriptures they definitely say yes there is there is life in various parts of the universe and uh, shri prabhupad would give a simple argument sometimes that if we look on the earth you know if even in your house there is a small crack in the wall sometimes you see ants coming out of there uh, so like the this earth is teeming with life so why would god create waste so much space that there's so much universe and nothing in it so uh what what science can honestly say at this stage by honestly i don't imply that science is being dishonest if it doesn't say this all that i'm implying is that there are certain claims that are valid based on what we know and there are others that are extrapolations all that science can tell us is that life as we know it has not been found on the universe as far as we have observed it science always gives us very qualified knowledge life as we know it means what that we don't really uh, when we are looking for life even if say we go to the moon what do we look for have we combed every single every single inch of the moon no we look for certain indicators 
say we look for the temperature whether it is suitable look for water we look for oxygen mm. but are these the sole preconditions or are these essential preconditions for life to be possible there are beings called extremophiles which live live in extreme conditions so deep inside the deep below the ocean in the ocean beds have been found certain beings which actually breathe in nitrogen dioxide and how can they even live like that they live they never see the sun and still they live on so all that we can say through science is that life as we know it does not uh, has not been found in the universe as far as we observe it from the spiritual perspective the soul itself uh, is indestructible soul is not affected by soul itself is not destroyed or damaged by any material condition so if the soul is given a appropriate body then it can live in any material condition so we could say that in different parts of the universe it's it's possible that souls may be existing in bodies in bodily forms that we are not aware of so that is the first part so in that sense uh, instead of aliens does life exist on other planets yes the the vedic scriptures do say yes now now can that life be perceived well it depends if we look at the look at the mahabharata or the ramayan if we consider this is the this is the terrestrial level then above us is the celestial level where the godly beings stay and below us is the subterranean level where the ungodly beings stay and of course beyond it all is the transcendental level so generally when beings from the celestial or the subterranean level come it's not that we can immediately perceive them say for example this when the sacrifices would be performed to appease the gods so only if the gods would be very pleased would they come and make themselves visible to the earthlings the earthly beings who are offering them sacrifices otherwise just by the smooth uninterrupted performance of the sacrifice they would infer that the gods are pleased so it's not that even if uh, the gods came to us we would the godly beings if they came to us we would be able to perceive them and the same can apply to demoniac beings also who can also make themselves invisible to human perception so <clears throat> is it possible for us to perceive well maybe not it depends on various factors including the the will of other beings <coughs> and our level of consciousness also so now thirdly <coughs> as far as what has been perceived well alien sightings have been you can classify them into some categories there are there are claimed perceptions of uh, of flying objects that exhibit behavior not normally seen in human airplanes then there are claims of alien abductions and uh, there are basically you could these are two of the most hyped claims or uh, now alien abductions they are many alien abductions have been strongly debunked mm -hmm. not all but many now there are some ivy league professors also who studied this field and they began as skeptics but over the period of time as they studied they found that more and more thoughtful people so the idea of alien abductions are some aliens come and say somebody is just going in a car and suddenly their car suddenly stops for no reason and then somebody comes and takes them and the idea of aliens abducting has also been romanticized in bollywood and then there are various kinds of uh, strange beings that come because of the uh, union between humans and aliens so it has gone to the domain of of widely popularized science fiction but but not just necessarily flying saucers but flying bodies that seem to defy the uh, the 
laws of gravity as we know them. There have been a significant number that have been cited and many security agencies also, the American defense and others, they have cited them. One of ISKCON's leaders, Devamrit Swami has written a book called Searching for Vedic India. There he gives a good amount of evidence for aliens. And Sadaput Prabhu is Dr. Richard L. Thompson. He's also, he was also a prominent ISKCON scientist. And he's written a book called Alien Identities, where also he talks significantly about uh, parallels between the description of uh, the movements of these unidentified flying objects and the description of certain flying objects in the Mahabharata. Say, for example, there was a demon, Shalua, who attacked Dwarka, and he had a he had a flying airplane. And its movements and the description of movements of UFOs and UFO sightings, there are significant similarities between the two. So we, we so we can say that some alien sightings uh, could be true. And rather than debating whether particular sightings are true or not, we can look at the bigger issue and recognize that the broad Vedic worldview does give a lot of room for aliens to exist and occasionally to interact with us also. Does that answer your question? Yes, Prabhu. So should we take one more question, Praji? One last one for today or uh, is it okay? Yeah, sure. Okay. One last question should be fine. The one, one last question for today. It is also on a similar lines. This question is from uh, Amit Kumar Yadav from Triple M UT Kanpur. He is asking Hare Krishna Prabhuji. My question is: Does ghost really exist? If yes, are there any type of ghost, and do they interact with human or harm them or control them? Okay. Do ghosts exist? Well, I have a I have a website called Spiritual Scientists where if you go to seek for search for ghosts, you will find a whole article on that. Uh, and I also have a full pass on this topic. I'll just quickly share a PowerPoint to explain the idea of ghosts. So if you hear terms of being, as you know, there's the soul and the subtle body and there's a gross body. The way normal, normally we live. Now, what happens in the case of death? Death is the soul along with the subtle body leave and normally after this the soul and subtle body go to a next body sometimes because of various reasons the the soul may not get a next body so when the soul doesn't get a next body that's what is called as a ghost so basically it is disembodied soul and some of these ghosts can enter into some other body this is called as possession so possession means there is the original person was there, but that person has become some person entered into that body and taken control of that body. So there's possessed person and the possessing person, possessing ghost. So now do ghosts exist from the Vedic perspective? Yes, born souls are ghosts. From the temporary research, and there been a significant amount of research that has been done. Uh, Alfred Wallace was a prominent uh, scientist who, who worked as Richard Dawkins, Rich, sorry, as Charles Darwin. And he, he, he also the co-founder of the theory of evolution. And he did a lot of other research. So one of his areas of study was in supernatural beings. And he said that I don't ask my readers for belief. All that I ask them for is, uh, is doubt in the infallibility of their current understandings, of your current understandings. So he, say, so he brings about a significant amount of research. So if ghosts exist, how do we really prove their existence? So as I said, science focuses on mathematical measurable parameters and it's difficult to mathematically measure the effects of subtle beings. So broadly speaking, ghosts can interact with humans in three ways. It's called as apparition, 
communication and possession so apparition means some people just see a form so maybe somebody some loud one has passed away and then they see suddenly their form appearing where being there for some time and maybe communicating with them and going away that's a, but just generally when you see something it's called apparition then communication is where they tell something so communication can happen that that that, that ghostly being them tell something or there are something called like planchets where there are mediums who communicate with deceased spirits and through them certain information comes to people and third is possession so now among these apparitions they are very difficult to scientifically establish because a person has them if you see a large number of people also had a particular vision or pertain person who had died we you could always dismiss it as like a mass hallucination that's what the skeptical approach would be but with respect to communication we could look at the verifiability of the information the possibility whether that information could have been got by other means or not and there is a devotee saint in dutakarma prabhu dr michael krimo he's written a book called human devolution where he analyzes uh, various cases of possessions and he just show that so of of communication and possessions and so he does when communication happens there are many cases where there is just no reasonable way where that person could have got that information which the medium through the medium was it was conveyed through a via planchet and with respect to possessions modern psychology sometimes call them as uh, personality dis split personality disorders now are all split personality disorders uh, because of possession no do all possession necessarily lead to split personality disorders these are very complicated things but the point is that the same person doesn't just behave in different ways that's like dr jekyll and mr hyde which is robert lindsay and in his fiction but there are sometimes there is a case of a A woman in Nagpur. You know, she lived in a small village near Nagpur, and once she was bitten by a snake, and this was well documented uh, in scientific research. If you read Human Evolution, she was bitten by a snake, and suddenly she started she started speaking Bengali, and started speaking in a very different voice. Now nobody in in, in that village was from Bengal. She had never been to Bengal. She had never learned a word of Bengali. And suddenly she was speaking fluent Bengali. where did she get that from so we could infer that there was some kind of possession but that's a inference now in some cases it may be true some cases may be personality disorder some cases it might just be uh, people pretending to for some ulterior motives we don't know so again the in principle ghosts do exist in practice is it that every person who feels haunted or who acts in strange ways is, is actually haunted uh we can be a little we need to be a little skeptical about the actual cases and observe them very carefully before we arrive at any particular conclusion okay so thank you very much shall we stop here panchu go prabhu yes thank you so much prabhu ji yes so thank you so much for your time uh, so dear students you saw how uh, beautifully prabhu ji could uh, answer so many uh, scientific questions with a spiritual perspective here i have put on the chat box uh, two of his websites the spiritual scientist.com and giza detail.com and uh, the bitly site is a shortened site for his books uh, which is available on amazon and tomorrow also so we will be having uh, question answers uh, which all of you can kindly put on this portal which i have put on this uh, uh, chat box so this is the same portal which you use for all the question answers please put your question answers questions which prabhu ji will answer tomorrow based on scientific uh, understandings thank you so much uh, students thank you very much chetan ji and prabhu we will seek for your association tomorrow also and for next week saturday also at 2:30 to 4 pm prabhu ji Hare Krishna thank you very much prabhu padhi chai chai Hare Krishna